trolling when Ghostbusters happened sure. and the trolling and <sighs> people have to really know how specific that sh is. Um, None of, none of the other girls got trolled like I did. And I hate to say it like this, but it is was because I was a black woman. And I hate to say that. I, hate I think to say it's that. also that you're a dark-skinned black woman. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I really hate to say that because it's, it's like... It's the truth, though. It's His grandmother compared me to the color of a paper bag and said that I was too chocolate and too dark chocolate for him. And he couldn't date me. And I said... What the hell? <laughs> Do you think there's still colorism in Hollywood? Huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. What do you think of when you see Zendaya, Rihanna, Beyonce? Be honest. Is it the same thing you see when you look at Whoopi Goldberg, Viola Davis, or Leslie Jones? Historically, blackness has been associated with negativity, ugliness, dirtiness, stupidity, and undesirability. During slavery, the racial caste system was on full display. Darker-skinned slaves were relegated to the fields to pick cotton, tobacco, and slash sugar canes. The mulattoes, many of whom were byproducts of rape, were allowed to work inside plantation homes, tending to the needs of the masters and their children. Naturally, this preferential treatment created a division, and the vestiges remain, one of which is colorism. For those of you who don't know, colorism is the prejudice or discrimination against individuals with a dark skin tone, typically among people of the same ethnic or racial group. And if you think colorism only exists in the black community, hmm, you're wrong. It stretches tentacles into many communities, including the Hispanic, Caribbean, Latin American, and South and East Asian communities. Believe how about girls? Definitely fair. Everybody wants a fair girl. Obviously fair. Fair and beautiful. That's the only thing that matters to be very specific if I talk about marriage. There's a famous 1895 oil painting known as Ham's Redemption. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen it before. In the painting, you can see a dark grandmother with her hands in the air praising God, and she's sitting next to her mulatto daughter and her daughter's white baby, and sitting down also to what I suppose is the mulatto daughter's white husband. The grandmother in this picture appears to be praising God for redeeming her family by removing the blackness brought about through miscegenation. In the Dominican Republic and many other Caribbean Spanish-speaking countries, it's not uncommon to hear some of the natives talking about mejorando la raza. Um, I remember when I lived in Cuba for almost two years, great experience by the way, um, that was something that I heard not only from white Cubans but um, some mulatos. Um, and you, you would always hear someone saying, hay que adelantar la raza, you know, you know, like you, you have to advance the race. And the way to do that again is by mixing, not just with like other mulattoes, but to be mixing with white people. That was the way to sort of advance the race, to purify the race. When I lived in Cuba, um, one of the things that I always got into heated battles with was, um, having conversations with native Cubans about my race. And, you know, they'd often ask me what I am. Then I'd be like, well, yo soy negra. And they'd be like, no, 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 no. Aquí en Cuba, tú eres mulata. You know, and I'd be like, mm, no, soy negra. You know, <laughs> and it would just be this back and forth thing. But, you know, if they're just going off of my tone, they're going off the tone of my skin, um, they would say that I was mulata. But I wasn't. And I'm not. When I asked uh, some of the folks there, like, why is there such an aversion to, you know, like darker skinned people, you know, because um, there were other students there from the Bahamas and other parts of the Caribbean and um, Africa, of course. Um, and one of the things I'd often hear is, you know, mm, me dan miedo, like, you know, like they scare me. And I'm like, why? <laughs> but again, Blackness is, is associated with darkness, ugliness, um, um, even danger, to be honest. So that's definitely a sentiment that you would hear in a lot of Hispanic and Latin American countries, um, that darker skinned people are somehow scary or less attractive or dangerous looking. These perceptions don't come out of nowhere, of course. It's no secret that we got a lot of our uh, beauty ideals from uh, Europe. I remember reading a Vox article in 2015 that cited a study that said that lighter skinned blacks and Hispanic people look smarter 
to white people. <laughs> you know, and that just kind of sent me down like this rabbit hole. And I remember reading this article um, from NPR. Uh, it was titled Behind Closed Doors, Colorism in the Caribbean, where a Miami Herald reporter did reports on the Dominican Republic in Cuba and Puerto Rico and did a report on colorism in the Dominican Republic. And I know that this is absolutely true. Like I said, I lived in Cuba for nearly two years and I definitely um, noticed a difference in the way I was treated or someone who was fairer than me with curlier hair was treated versus somebody who was darker skinned. Um, I heard people say there's no racism in, in Cuba, um, but there's definitely a class system um, based on skin tone, you know, colorism. In the Bahamas where I'm from, um, we've also had to contend with different types of attitudes related to skin tone. We don't say light skinned people in the Bahamas. We say she bright. You don't got to have nothing in the head. You just, you know, your skin is bright. You're bright skin. Or we say mango skin. I remember the first time I told somebody about mango skin and they were like, mango skin? Aren't mangoes like green? I wonder if I have a mango inside my fridge. Hold on. Let me see if I can find a mango. I think I bought some. Hold on one second. Hold on. Okay, so y'all don't judge me for this mango because it's been in there for like about two weeks now. I was supposed to make smoothies with this, but this is <laughs> this is like the complexion that is, and this is old. You can see it's like pruning and everything. Um, but this is like the complexion that a lot of Bahamians kind of favor. And I mean, I'm certainly not that color, but you know, if you're darker than this, yeah, you know, you know, you still have those perceptions. Uh, people have grown for sure. You know, some people don't care, but. You know, this is the tone that a lot of people still favor. They still favor this tone in the Bahamas. So this is what you call mango skin. So it's not the red skin or the green skin. If it's like, you know, a green, green mango, it's like, this is mango skin. Okay. Just so you know. But I remember growing up and, and hearing so many stories from like my aunts and my cousins and my mother um, and neighbors about how, you know, dark skinned people couldn't work in the banks in the Bahamas. You know, you had to be a certain tone if you wanted to be a uh, flight attendant with like the national flag carrier, like the main um, uh, airline. Um, and so you can, you can only imagine like what that would have done to people who were barred from going into certain spaces because of their skin tone. So for the record, 85% of Bahamians are black and um, they are the descendants of slaves that came from West Africa. So the majority of people are of a darker skin tone. Of course, there's been mixing over the generations. So, you know, People have different skin tones. A lot of people don't know this, um, but my country, the Bahamas, was very segregated in the 50s. Um, black Bahamians knew that they were not allowed in certain spaces. Um, they were not allowed to apply for certain jobs. They knew that there were limits to where they could go and where they could live. I remember interviewing people years ago and they talked about having separate water fountains. You know, sometimes we get so caught up on um, you know, the Jim Crow laws in the United States that we forget that there was segregation in many, many other countries as well. Um, and it was only when my country wanted to start courting American, African American tourists to our shores that, you know, for tourism, that things started really turning around because like the officials on the island were told in no uncertain terms that African Americans would not be willing to travel to the Bahamas and face discrimination. So that wasn't happening. So, you know, things had to turn around. I want to talk about the paper bag test. Um, and a lot of people still don't, they've never heard of this or if they've heard about it, um, I'm sure it's pretty triggering for a lot of them. Um, but the paper bag test still exists to this day. According to Georgetown sociology professor, Michael Eric Dyson, New Orleans invented the brown paper bag party usually at a gathering in a home where anyone darker than the bag attached to the door was denied entrance. So if you were darker than that paper bag, good luck to you. You were not coming in this, this party. Meantime, Dr. Janet Taylor in an Essence magazine article noted that in the 1950s, some wealthy black communities had the blue vein rules for membership. So if you again were darker or browner than a, a grocery paper bag, you were excluded. And if you had visible blue veins, then you were you were allowed into the club. I remember several years ago, and I know a lot of you um, remember this, Matthew Knowles, who is the father of Beyonce and Solange Knowles and, and their you know former manager, he was on so many different um, podcasts and, and, and quoted in articles uh, talking about the fact that his daughter Beyonce wouldn't be successful without her lighter uh, skin tone. And he basically said that Kelly Rowland, who was her bandmate, 
had the opposite effect, you know, because she was a chocolate chocolate girl who is, I mean, like her, her freaking skin is like fire. I don't even understand. This is so stupid. Kelly is the bomb. Um, and then, of course, Solange, his other daughter, went on record talking about how she still has cousins down in Louisiana who still do the paper bag test. Um, so to to um, Dyson's credit, you know, he said that this thing originated in Louisiana. So it was kind of crazy, kind of bizarre to hear that people were still doing this. And this was only a few years ago. I'm like, who's doing that? You would think this is just on the lower level, but even in Hollywood, a lot of black actresses get it. Viola Davis has said that <laughs> colorism and the paper bag test is alive and kicking in, in the industry. And you heard earlier um, Lupita Nyong'o, who is an Oscar winner, talking about the fact that it is still around um, in, in Hollywood. And there's no doubt about that. Uh, a lot of times you'll see Hollywood directors want a black lead in a role, but they want a black lead that looks safe, unless it's one of those slave dramas or something that's really dramatic and they just need like or 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 you're dealing with like a a prominent figure and you need someone who's dark skin but we also saw what they do too with um remember that movie that uh, uh zoe saldana did with um nina simone and rather than getting a, a darker girl to play or a darker woman to play that role they basically put her in blackface just and she's darker but she's not as dark as Nina Simone was and she doesn't have the same hair texture and all that um but you know again the colorism um was definitely on display there you know so to keep up I suppose with um the standards of beauty what you'll see is a lot of black women Indian women um and even some Asian women bleaching their skin um so that they don't appear too dark um, and we've seen this booming industry with skin lightening products. I remember this market study was published by global industry analysts that said that the global skin lighteners market was projected to reach about almost $12 billion by 2026. You know what is $12 billion on bleaching cream? Ugh. The U.S. accounts for 4% of that share in the global market. And China, which is the world's second largest economy, um, has an estimated market size of $5.5 billion in the year by the year 2026. So they're spending a quite a quite a they're spending a lot of money on skin lightening products as well. While you have a lot of blacks and Hispanics who um, I believe are, you know, using these bleaching creams to have a more to have a lighter complexion because they want to emulate European standards. In China, it's it's kind of different. That's what I've been reading in so many different reports. Like it's not about wanting to appear white. It's about wanting to appear wealthy. In Asia, being darker skinned is associated with being working class. So you could tell if someone were uh, wealthy or poor just based on their skin tone. This is all just so interesting to me. Um, we always have these conversations, my friends and I, and and I, I, I love to kind of like get to the root of these things, the genesis of it. Um, but it's just so bizarre to me because I think variety is the spice of life and color tone, like I like all skin. I love beautiful, um, dark skin. Like I'm such a dark skin lover. I love brown shades. I love caramel shades. I love white shades. It's like, I thought that was the whole point is to everybody for everybody to look different and just have an appreciation for everybody's beauty. But it just seems like there's this one standard of beauty that everybody's clamoring for. Um, but I just wanted to bring this conversation this week. Nothing really precipitated this conversation. It's just something I wanted to talk about on my channel for a long time. Um, and I finally had the chance. All right, guys, you know the drill. Let's talk down below. And please, please, everybody, just try to be nice to one another. Um, if you are a white person, uh, please let me know if you look at different types of black people differently. Do you do you think, um, you know, there's a more of a standard of beauty if they have fair skin? And please, people, don't be mean to the folks who are responding in the in the comment section. People get mad about me uh, saying, hey, you know, try to be nice and all that stuff. Like, listen, if you want turmoil and drama, this, this really ain't the channel for you, okay? Because I'm trying to spark some serious conversation in a respectful manner. And so I do want white folks to weigh in and let me know. If you're his, from the Hispanic community and you've fallen prey to these um, beauty ideals or you're from the black community or Asian community, please weigh in and tell me, um, you know, your experience. Have any of you bleached? Why did you do it? If you stopped, why did you stop? If you're still doing it, why are you doing it? Let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. Let's have these conversations, okay? Um, I want the truth, the unfiltered truth, and the only way we're gonna get that is if we have a safe space where people feel like they can talk um, without um, being bullied or being 
ostracized. Like just, just let people talk and let's just get a conversation going. Let's get the dialogue going. Okay. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.